the age of uh, fighting sail and the both recreational sailing and uh, really the origins of this topic, which were on a 95 degree day in August when the, uh, the winds were blowing the two knots uh, out on the, the Chesapeake. And uh, just to occupy my thinking, I uh, went back to a namesake of mine, um, Admiral Horatio Nelson, um, unfortunately, no relation, but um, uh, recalling that I had heard that at the Battle of Trafalgar, um, the English, after two years of chasing the French and Spanish fleets, uh, had finally caught them uh, off of uh, the coast of Spain. And uh, the wind was at two knots, and they bobbed and bobbed for hours as the English tried to catch up with the French and the Spanish who were trying to, uh, to escape. So it made me start thinking about, well, what, what was it like uh, back then in terms of, uh, of, of ships, the conditions they faced, the sailing operations, and how did it compare to today? I mean, in a sense, it's kind of like uh, a dog uh, is a descendant of a wolf, what's in common, what's not. And um, so I said, I'd like to put together something that could really look at the, the now uh, and the, the, the then. Um, types of boats, uh, the anatomy of the, the ship, uh, the operation of a boat, and then really what their purpose uh, is. Uh, maybe in a modern day sense, it's for cruising or racing, but, but back then it was, was for fighting. And so we've uh, assembled a discussion uh, where we will talk lightly about the the, the now, um, I will, will be discussing that. But really, we're going to focus a great deal on the then, um, and we'll bring together all the elements that I just uh, mentioned, and um, the culmination, really, discussion of the the Battle of the Chesapeake or the Battle of the Capes, which happened in 1781, kind of right at the beginning of what is considered to be the, the apex of the, the age of fighting sail, 1775 to 1815. But a discussion of the, 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 the Battle uh, of the Capes, uh, which uh, ironically, even though it was instrumental in deciding the, the Revolutionary War, uh, it did not involve Americans, just English and, and, and French. So um, I'm very fortunate uh, to have the the then portion of this discussion to be led by, uh, by Grant Walker. Uh, I thought we were gonna have a little bio in for Grant Walker, but let me tell you a little bit more about Grant. Grant is an education specialist at the uh, US Naval Academy uh, Museum, which if I may say is a uh, advertisement, is an incredible museum to, to, to visit, and encourage everyone to, uh, to do that in, in person. Um, but um, Grant, an education specialist, uh, actually had gone to West Point and uh, crossed the Rubicon at some point um, in the early 80s to come to the Naval Academy, uh, getting his uh, uh, MA uh, in postgraduate work at um, the, there, there we go. Uh, and then um, being a lecturer at the Academy with midshipmen and then joining museum uh, full-time in uh, 1993. And uh, among his, his many uh, areas of knowledge, particularly uh, models of ships, of which the Navy has an extensive collection, and, and Grant has curated uh, the, the latest exhibition on those, those models. And while we have a, a, um, uh, a, a, a nice model here uh, at, at, the Naval uh, at the Sailing School, uh, of the HMS Victory. We've got um, uh, some fabulous models over at the, the Naval Academy. So I encourage you uh, to, to go see that. Um, Grant, um, there we'll pick up on the, the topics uh, momentarily. Just a few uh, housekeeping items uh, in, t in terms of Zoom. Well, this is being recorded, so people should be aware of that. Uh, people um, in the audience certainly can ask questions during the, the, the talk. We'll kind of monitor it because we're scheduled for two hours. And um, since Grant, uh, Ian and I spent four hours walking through the museum, I, I know uh, we'll, we'll use up all of that time and perhaps a little bit extra, but you can uh, ask questions during the, uh, the presentation and we'll try to um, filter those in. Uh, just um, on a, also on a more general administrative side, 
Um, if any of you um, are uh, looking for a Valentine's Day presents um, for any significant other, <laughs> The, the sailing school has come out with special <laughs> editions. Um, I may be buying three or four of these myself or, uh, Jenny, don't look at this. Um, but uh, anyway, if one's interested in that, uh, we certainly, we have them online, you can stop by. Um, and then also, if you're enjoying this talk and you're, you're new to the, the sailing school, if you will, uh, I would suggest you go to our website and there's a pop-up and Telltales are, um, monthly uh, newsletter, um, whose editor is uh, Natalie, and who is here today uh, orchestrating all this. But um, uh, anyway, uh, this if there's events such as this that you like, uh, it'll keep you up to date in terms of what's happening in the school and a number of general interest um, items there. So uh, keep that in mind. Okay, so on to the, to the, the now. And um, uh, I will say that um, I enumerated topics in terms of type of boat, uh, the anatomy of boat operation, and their, their ultimate purpose. Mm -hmm. uh, but um, in order to give you a foundation, obviously there's a lot of seasoned sailors here, uh, but there are some people that are new or maybe just some history uh, buffs, if you will, that are, are zooming in. Uh, I'll lay a, a foundation that Grant can then build off of when he's talking about um, the, the ships of the, the age of fighting sail. Uh, and this will be uh, a bit like a motorcycle tour of the Louvre, as uh, one wag once said. <laughs> You'll see a lot of great things, but you can do it for very uh, quickly. Um, if you're interested more in sailing and learning about it, the school has some very expensive lessons that you can take. Uh, it's all you can enjoy, but... Um, <laughs> Already, I lost the audience. <laughs> so, just in terms of starting out with the, the, the type of boat, um, boats are typically described by the rigging. And in recreational sailing today, the most popular rig is the sloop rig uh, boat, uh, single mast, uh, two sails, um, jib, and, and a mainsail. And the orientation of the sails is from uh, bow to stern, which is when you, you uh, see Ber Grant's presentation, you'll realize the importance of that. There certainly is a keel that extends below uh, the, the hull, which uh, stops a boat from, if you will, sliding uh, sideways or laterally uh, in wind and also provides a counterbalance to the, the forces of wind that are going to be at the top. And you can see there's um, uh, a rudder uh, in, in terms of, of steering. So sloop rig boat, this is a Rainbow 24 at the, the school. Uh, but um, typically, as you look across the boat, you'll see this is what people are sailing. An important aspect then really in terms of how a boat is rigged is this issue of points of sail. And uh, I like to think of it, first of all, as this element of uh, push or pull. And um, one of the things when um, uh, the, um, Jenny and I bought the sailing school in 2014, um, sailing was really new to me. Jenny is the, the expert sailor. So I, like I think a lot of people thought, well, sailboats move forward because they're pushed. Uh, the wind gets behind them and you push. And then if you look at this diagram, if uh, the wind was coming out of the, the top, uh, if a boat is here, it push, the wind pushing on the sails, then you can understand how it moves forward. But then someone asked me, well, Rick, well, then how do you go into the wind? And then I was uh, left without an answer. But the issue is, it, or the, the, the mechanics of it, if you will, is it's, it's pulled. Um, there's a, an aspect called lift. And if you've been on a plane, you perhaps understand it, how a plane somehow rises and its lift is, there's low pressure on the underside, excuse me, high pressure on the underside, low pressure on the upside. The vacuum, if you will, or the differential is filled, it gives lift, that's how a plane rises, or it helps move a boat forward. Uh, this is important um, for today's modern boats because they can sail upwind. There is an area in which they can't sail, the no-go no zone or irons, but they can move up uh, into the wind, which is a huge difference, if you will, from the, the ships of the, um, 
prior period, if you will, if they're not rigged that way, if they're square rigged, they're really only dealing with 180 degrees from nine o'clock to, to uh, six o'clock six to three o'clock uh, when the, the, the compass or the watch face is opposed to above. And that'll become important because things such as tacking, where you move the front of the boat uh, through the wind um, becomes uh, a complete issue in terms of handling uh, the square rig boats. Uh, and then jibing, therefore, more popular, if you will, when the, the, the uh, stern moves through the wind uh, is the way of, of operating. Uh, in terms of the anatomy of a boat, uh, there's some items here which are, are pertinent to the discussion, but you'll, you'll see uh, a number of things in terms of uh, how a boat is steered, in terms of uh, having a, a wheel, which gives mechanical advantage uh, versus something such as a tiller where you, you push and pull on it, but um, uh, much more action needs to be done for the same amount of, of movement. Uh, a rudder, modern sailboats are typically sailed by rudder. Sails can steer, uh, steer boats. In terms of the equipment on boats, uh, winches, blocks, things such as windlasses, how do you get a mechanical advantage to move around? What you can see are, are some pretty simple landings uh, on the boat uh, in terms of rigging, um, uh, shrouds, and, and stays. Uh, to operate the, the sails, you have uh, winds, and getting a mechanical advantage on that winch being uh, incredibly important. But uh, these are the types of things that are um, uh, important in terms of operating a, a modern sailboat. Um, and I would suggest perhaps a little bit different uh, in the boats that, uh, that Grant is going to, uh, to discuss. Um, below the deck, um, a number of our um, uh, students and Cuba club members here will recognize this as the below deck of a rainbow. Um, where, <laughs> well, uh, it has been upon three areas that, in terms of life on a, uh, a boat, are incredibly important and incredibly interesting in the, the age of fighting sail. Uh, but obviously, uh, the stove in the galley, uh, the bathroom, or even or the head, where even here doesn't seem to have too much privacy, and uh, a cabin befitting uh, uh, well, Lord uh, Lord Nelson. But um, again, an important aspect to think about today and how that was in a different era. Um, so. Uh, you then move on to the actual operation of the, the, the boat, and you have uh, the, the captain and things that he's uh, responsible for. Um, so uh, one of them is, one, knowing what your, your mission is and then picking the correct crew for it. I mean, are you going to be cruising? Are you going to be racing? Is it going out for a day or going out for, for a month? Um, this crew here, I would suggest that there's at least one person that you would not want to select unless you need some ballast for your boat. <laughs> but uh, uh, ASA uh, in their, their books, and we've drawn uh, the, these slides from um, uh, our, our collection of, uh, of courses, ASA uh, 101, um, Basic Keelboat Sailing or Sailing Made Easy, which then I guess makes 103. Uh, coastal cruising sailing made difficult uh and then and then 104 which is bare boat chartering but uh, one of the things they discuss is the importance of selecting your crew having them know their position and then uh commanding them and um uh with this motley crew perhaps not so difficult but i think is great will illustrate uh critical in life and death um in the age of fighting sail um in terms of navigation tools and weather forecasting, things that uh, a skipper has to be aware of uh, today uh, can be very basic in terms of compass and paper chart, uh, but uh, increasingly just the electronics, the sophistication that, that come to, to bear there and the, the, the weather forecasting, the tools that one can use for that day, that week, that month uh, versus an era when um, kind of, uh, knowledge and experience 
uh, would be key in terms of uh, the preparation. Uh, one thing I would say in this, that down here, um, it's not so evident, but it's a it's a, a site that here there's uh, showing wind direction in the Chesapeake De Bay. But um, and Natalie, if you remember, was it called Knoll School? N U L L uh, School. There's Knoll School. Uh, I would recommend people just to take a, a, a look at it. Uh, Ryan Miller, previous speaker, uh, the meteorologist um, in NBC Four in DC, uh, he spoke at the Cuba Club and he set us to that site and. If nothing else, just the, the artistry of it is mesmerizing, even if you don't want a, a, a weather forecast. But very sophisticated tools are available uh, today. Um, the um, uh, other things in terms of, uh, you know, uh, captain things that they must be concerned about, not only the creation of the crew, uh, navigating their, uh, plotting out their course, navigating it, worried about the, the, the weather. Um, they also, they have to provision for their, their crew, depending on the, the length of it. There's a whole section in 104 in terms of uh, how one does that. Um, but a number of things that need to be uh, brought together. And, and then once you get to wherever you're going, well, are you docking, docking under power? Are you gonna moor your boat? Or are you gonna anchor your boat? You can anchor it aft, uh, uh, two anchors of, uh, aft uh, and, and bow. Um, so, Tremendous amount goes into what the, the captain knows and the people that he relies on to execute it. And one thing that um, uh, ASA really stresses is safety first. And uh, that's anywhere from um, lifelines you saw earlier so people don't fall over. Uh, things like if you have a kitchen fire, fire is the worst thing that can happen on a, a boat. So having a live fire is certainly uh, dangerous uh, to even what happens when a man goes overboard. And we have an, uh, an elaborate explanation of how to pick that person up if they've fallen off here and you're in your boat, you come back around to pick them up. Uh, I suggest it may have been different in the, the age of in terms of <laughs> safety. So uh, uh, recreational sailing certainly differs um, uh, from uh, today. But um, so you, you have these issues in terms of the type of boat, how it's rigged. Uh, above and below deck, what it looks like, uh, how it's operated, and then really um, to the, the, the purpose. So um, as I mentioned, goal of sailing, you could be out just cruising for a day or for a week, um, or you could be uh, racing. And this is something that we've certainly gotten more into at the uh, school in terms of the Cuba Club, the Monday night uh, regattas. But, um, you know, your, your chart, the area that you're racing in, uh, the area you're supposed to stay in, uh, but uh, uh, all become uh, important. But particularly, I think, uh, when you think of cruising and planning, and there's certainly uh, an, a huge aspect of that in terms of the age of fighting sail, if you're, you're headed out for months. But uh, I was I'm struck by the perhaps similarities in terms of racing and things that uh, one wants to be uh, concerned with then. Um, in fact, this is um, uh, a racing uh, tactics uh, chart. Um, and when I first looked at it, it, it kind of looked like a or perhaps not well-formed line of battle that one might, might see. But uh, anywhere from knowing uh, the pre-battle, pre-race planning in terms of uh, what's the wind, uh, what's the current, waves, are they uh, chopping up and down and, and therefore uh, confusing the orientation uh, of the boat? Are there weather systems that are coming up? Uh, all of that becomes important as you think about then your, your, your strategy. You know, do you uh, want to be on the, 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 the starboard tack with the windward side to have an advantage and then also in terms of the, the rules of engagement, if you will, um, have, have a, 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 an advantage, excuse me. But um, then uh, as you go out, you're, you have to keep track of your, your competition, where they are, where they are, and engage them. And I would say that one of the, the, the big differences is that while well, you get very near your competition, um, in uh, racing, uh, at all costs uh, in terms of a crash, um, 
that may not have been the case uh, in the, the, the age of uh, uh, fighting sale. So what's struck me is that there's a lot of things that uh, have changed, but there are certain basics in terms of, of sailing the boats and um, how one engages in, in tactics uh, that we now experience today. But uh, let me see if we can turn back the, the, the clock then and uh, ask Grant really to, to talk about uh, the, the age of fighting sail and in particular uh, kind of the uh, tremendous battle that took place that um, is instructive as well as uh, history changing. So, Grant. How's that? Better? Get the up. Okay. I know. All right. Sorry about that. Anyway, uh, yeah, I went to the uh, to to West Point, and then I had a a, a normal junior officer career. Eventually, I ended up getting into the foreign area officer program in the Army, um, where certain folks study the defense policies of some area of the world. Uh, get a stab at the language spoken there, and then um, if it's an ally, they send these foreign area officers uh, over there, and typically they go to a, a senior staff college of some sort, which is what I did in Brussels, because my area of, of uh, operation was the Low Countries. So they sent me to the language school out in Monterey, California, which was a dream assignment, I gotta tell you, where I studied Dutch, and then they sent me to Germany, not realizing that German and Dutch are not the same language. And then later on, they sent me back to the language institute. I got to go there twice um, to study French the second time, and armed with Dutch and French, they sent me over to Belgium. So they actually did that the right way. I know some people who really ended up in a different part of the world than they expected but i thought i would go there and i did um i was there for a couple of years in school and right at the end i got married over there to a belgian girl and then the school was over and i needed a job so i called up the department of the army and they offered me a couple of silly ones and then they said how about teaching at the naval academy and i said the naval academy <laughs> well i'd always wanted to teach so I said, that'll, that'll do just fine. And I thought Annapolis had some of that old world charm that my Belgian wife would, uh, would recognize. So here we came. And uh, for the next six years, I taught history in the academy uh, history department. Uh, when I took the job, I thought they were going to send me to poli sci. That's why I accepted, because all of my background was in political science. But they said no. Uh, you're going to teach history, and they gave me two weeks to bone up before the class started. And for the next six years, I taught a lot of Western Civ from the Greeks to the present and a lot of naval history. Um, then I got out and I simply crossed the street and took up digs in the museum because the history department and the museum are literally uh, face one another across Decatur Road. And I've been there ever since. I was introduced as the education specialist, and indeed I was for quite a while. I, I switched over to being a curator. I much prefer the curator job, uh, but I enjoyed both. Uh, what kept me here for more than my initial six years and the end of my career were the ship models at the academy. I can remember very well that I uh, back in those days, the precious models that we have, models we call dockyard models, were basically scattered all over the yard or in storage. We only had about a dozen on display. And I admired them, but one day I was looking at two of them that were in the history department and um, an older professor pointed out to me, he said, I think the labels on these two models are switched. One was 1695 and the other was 1705. And I thought, well, that's only 10 years difference. How can you tell that? And he said, well, because this gizmo wasn't invented until 1700, so it couldn't be on the 1695 one, and yet there it is. And this light bulb went on in my head. And I said, you mean 
these models are that accurate and they were built um, contemporaneously with the actual ship. He said, oh yeah, that's how it worked. And that's why I've been here ever since. Those, the thing about the dockyard models are that they were built in the same time and place as the ship they represent. And um, over the age of sail, they didn't actually start building scale ship models until the 1650s. There were church models before then, votive models, but they weren't built to scale. We may have the oldest one in the world uh, at the academy. There's a Swedish one that claims to be from 1653 and our oldest model drops somewhere between 1650 and 1654. Doesn't matter which one is older and in the long run, what we can see is how they were building ships in the 1650s. And um, we were notified, the Academy was notified in 1935 that we were about to receive a bequest and the bequest was a ship model collection in private hands owned by a guy named Rogers, Colonel Henry H. Rogers. And Rogers had assembled an, uh, uh, an enormous collection really of these very uh, rare dockyard ship models. And he basically gave us four dozen of them. Uh, most maritime museums would kill for one. And all of a sudden we had this. And at the time, nobody knew essentially what to do with them. But over time, we've studied them more and more and more. And, and by studying the model, you can learn about the ship that it represents. And our collection is so broad and deep that you can actually do a course on the development of, uh, of uh, a ship's lines uh, throughout the entire age of sail from the 16th, well, not the entire age of sail, but from the entire time period that these models were built from the 1950s to the very end of the age of sale in the 1840s. So it is a heck of a collection. We um, modified, we renovated, that's the word, we renovated our building uh, back in 2008 and nine. So it's still pretty doggone modern. And we made a decision early on that we would put every dockyard model that was in presentable condition on display. And actually, you wouldn't know this, but if you looked at the world as a uh, as a whole, you would see that models are uh, basically not in favor uh, anymore in maritime museums all over the place. Whereas 50, 60 years ago, these uh, museums were full of models on public display. That's not the case anymore. One museum after another, after another in this country and also overseas have taken a lot of their models off display. But we're uh, going against the stream, if you will, by putting more and more of them on display. So, um, so that's what kept me here. And while I was studying all of the, the models, uh, I developed a course, a, a section, uh, just a one hour class, if you will, on the fundamentals of life in the age of sail using our ship models. I start off with a model that uh, I, I actually start off by doing what I just told you, explaining what dockyard models are, how they came to be, and, um, and the fact that, I, I like to emphasize the fact that the dockyard models are not the model maker's best guess at what that old ship looked like, because the model was made in the same dockyard, generally a royal dockyard in England, because we have English models, but the French, the Dutch, Spanish, they had them as well, but we, we're, ours are English. And as I say, they're not the model maker's best guess because they were made at the same time and place in the same dockyard and the model and the ship itself were both built to the same plan, to the same draft. And the scale of the drafts, way, way back when, the earliest drafts that we have, about 1700, um, are, built, uh, are drawn to a scale of one to 48, which means that an inch on the piece of paper equaled uh, 48 inches on the actual ship. 
Now they didn't build all of them at quarter inch scale. That also means that a, a quarter inch equals a foot. So a figure on one of these things would be about uh, five, five and a half uh, feet tall or six feet tall. It'd be about an inch and a quarter or an inch and a half tall. Yes, sir. What was the purpose of the model? What was the purpose of the models? It's a wonderful question. Um, and there's been an awful lot of misinformation. We're in the age of misinformation, but it's been out there for a long time, trust me. Um, when people realize that the models and the ships were built at the same time and place, they almost always conclude, well, they must have built the model first because that's the easy part. And then they used the model in the construction of the ship and they worked out all, you know, could you get all these benches, could you fit that many guns in it and so forth. That's actually not true. These dockyard models took several years to build. They were built um, by under the direction of the master shipwright of the Royal, of a Royal dockyard where ships were being made for the king or queen. And some of the people, I, I'll use an example. There was a guy named Charles Sergison, S-E-R-G-I-S-O-N. He was a very high ranking guy for 30 years in the civil side of the Royal Navy uh, back in the time of Pepys back in, in fact, he followed Samuel Pepys, the great diarist in office. And he was a, he was a very high ranking guy in what we would consider the Department of the Navy. He'd be on the SECNAV staff and he would be very high in relative terms. And everybody in the Navy knew that Charles Sergison loved models, really, really nice ship models. So if you wanted to get in on the good side of Charles Sergison, what did you do? You gave him a ship model, a nice ship model. And in return, Charles Sergison would say, well, thank you very much. This is gonna look great in my house and maybe I can do a good turn for you in your career. They weren't bribes the way we think of it, but they were kind of bribes. And they, they were not built and paid for by the Navy. They were built and paid for by individuals and they were bestowed upon high ranking uh, individuals in the Navy, like retired admirals and captains and members of the King's Navy Committee and so forth. And they would take these models and whisk them off into the countryside and set them up in their great piles of bricks that were all over Scotland and England. So at one time, these models were literally scattered all over England and Scotland in great manor houses and castles and whatnot. And they were passed down from generation to generation. But the idea that you could spend two, three, four years working on a ship model before they started building the real ship to defend the shores, it just doesn't hold up at all. They did use models in the design process, but our dockyard models like this model are hollow. And um, they're as nicely fitted out below decks, even where you can't see them, as they are on the exterior. Um, and it makes little sense that they would wait around for a couple of years for a model to be built before they started building the actual ship. But some clever people in England figured out once they had determined that uh, one way to describe a three dimensional ship on a two dimensional piece of paper, um, is by means of water lines, horizontal water lines. And you could see, I, sh I should have a draft here or a plan, but you'll see that um, from the keel up, they would draw lines on there and then they could use that it, uh, to help describe the actual shape of this three-dimensional uh, object. And they did that on paper, and then they started doing it on models. Or maybe they first did it on models and then figured it, out, figured it out on paper, but about the same time. And what they would do is they would build models, not hollow like this, 
but solid. In fact, they called them solids or block models, and they were made up simply of different planks of wood that were uh, shaped to the shape of the hull at a certain uh, depth uh, of water, and then they were stacked up, glued together, fared, and then you got a you got a model that had the lines, the exterior lines of a ship, and they were in such a rush that they didn't even put things on them like, like the figurehead or the quarter gallery. They painted them on. They painted them so cleverly that a lot of them looked three D, and you have to look twice. But they could turn out a block model in as little as three weeks. I found a whole story of it in the archives over in England of a guy named Mr. Serby who approached the Navy in 1701 and said, I've got a new design that's revolutionary in this, the, the, the design of a stern of a certain size ship. And they said, well, OK, maybe so. But um, just like not everybody in the Navy Department today can read a blueprint, a, a ship's plan, they couldn't back then either. But what they could do is they could look at a model. So uh, the guy in charge of this whole operation directed two of the master shipwrights to, to and send to London a block model of their next proposed ship of that same size. And they were supposed to do that in two weeks and bring those, those models to London where they would compare them with a block model that Mr. Serby had made. Well, they didn't make it in two weeks, but in three weeks, they did. Three weeks later, they were there. They put these block models on a table, pulled up chin whiskers, and they said, Mr. Serby, there's nothing new in your design, so hit the road. And then he, he came back with another design later on. But the block models could be turned out in such a short period of time that they did become part of the design process. As a matter of fact, after 1715, the master shipwrights at the various, there were about half a dozen of these royal dockyards, they were required to submit, along with a plan for their next proposed ship, a block model with it. So they, they did that. Um, those were probably made by the master shipwright himself. He's a very busy guy, but uh, the block models he could probably do. He didn't have time to make dockyard models. He always fobbed that off on some of his subordinates, and um, they found some the, the sailors that were best equipped to work in miniature and put them to work. They got the, the actual shipwrights, the guys who made these models, we call them model rights, they got paid the same salary they would have gotten had they been pounding great big spikes into full-size ships. Only they were given a shed or a hut, they had a nice stove, they had an apprentice to keep it stoked, life was good. Um, the only thing they couldn't do with the model once they were done with one of these dockyard models is keep it. They had to turn it over to the master shipwright who put his name and initials on the model, not the guys who actually made it, but his name, and then he gave it to people like Charles Sergison and said, this is my gift to you. And Sergison turned around and did uh, the, did the master shipwright a good turn. So that's how they worked. They were the 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 short answer then is that they were designed and built as gifts, as gifts. Only the solids, the blocks, were made um, as part of the design process. And I also have I found a letter from one of the master shipwrights sent in to London saying, okay, I sent you my block model for the last thing. Can I have it back? Uh, we want to do some stuff with it. And they, wrote, and they wrote back and said, no, you may not have it back. Now it's part of the record of that ship. So there are no block models anywhere except in London. Those became property of the Navy. There's 68 of them over there. And um, uh, there's hardly any in private hands anywhere. So that's a long-winded answer about what was the, the, the purpose of these dockyard models. In a couple of hundred years in the age of sail, starting in about 1650, they turned out about 450 or maybe 500 of them. Um, and our collection has over 50 of that number. Um, as I said, in Greenwich, in London, they have 250, which makes sense. They're English. 
Um, but if you went over to the National Maritime Museum today, you'd only find about half a dozen models on display. All the rest of them are in storage. And the Dutch have taken their models out. Uh, they're kind of worried about rising waters in the Netherlands. And um, so they moved them way inland into the Dutch Alps, which are about 100 feet. Well, <laughs> won't the models float? Uh, no, we came pretty close, close to trying uh, to experimenting with that in Hurricane Isabel. You remember Isabel a while ago? Um, Isabel wiped out the academy. All of the buildings on the river were flooded. And we had one of our models over in one of those buildings, and it was about uh, it was on a table about this high off the ground, and the water came to about there. And that water, do you remember that? It was gross. It was really disgusting. Um, oh yeah, they redid everything at the academy. They spent a hundred million bucks getting over over uh, Hurricane Isabel. Yeah, okay, so that's, uh, we haven't even gotten to this, but when I did the this hour long course for midshipmen on the development of, of the sailing uh, warship, I describe a ship, and I'll show you this ship in a moment. In 1637, they built a very important ship in England called the Sovereign of the Seas, and she was, um, she, she was the product, if you will, of two building traditions that grew up in Europe after the fall of the Roman Empire. So you go way back into the 470s and so forth, Rome is gone. And in the vacuum that was created, two different shipbuilding uh, um, uh, uh, what do I want to call it? Two, two different ways of designing and building ships grew up. One in the north, one in the south. When I talk about the north, I'm talking about England and northern France and uh, uh, Germany and so forth. When I'm talking about the south, I'm talking about the Mediterranean. And as I say, in the five, six, seven hundreds, uh, shipbuilding took a back seat, but gradually they started building and they were building a certain kind of ship that basically derived from the Viking ships. Everybody knows what a Viking ship looks like. And the, that's, that gave the drive to all of the ship building in Northern Europe for several hundred years. Meanwhile, down in the Mediterranean, they were developing their ways of doing it. And they didn't know what, what uh, the people in England were doing. And the people in England didn't know what the people in the Med were doing when it came to designing and building ships until a certain series of events <laughs> occurred in the high Middle Ages that mixed the North and the South and their building traditions. What was that? Do you have any idea? In the mid, in, this would be in the 1200s, 1300s, the Crusades. The Crusades is where these two building traditions came together. And I imagine when the guys from England worked their way down the coast and entered the Mediterranean through the Straits of Gibraltar, they probably looked around with great big eyes and said, what in the heaven's name is that thing sitting here? And they're all over the place. They don't look like our ships. And I imagine the reaction in the Med was the same thing. What are these things coming from England? We've never seen ships like that before. And without going into all of the specifics, between the 1200s and the 1600s, what shipbuilders did is they took the um, the most usable features of both building traditions and mixed them together. And by the 1500s, certainly late 1400s, 1500s, they were building that kind of a vessel, which is called a carrack, C-A-R-R-A-C-K. And if you'll notice, here, these things were um, very heavily built up on the bow and stern. In fact, they called these things castles, and that wasn't a that wasn't a, a mistake, if you will. 
warfare at sea in, uh, in the Middle Ages was essentially warfare on land shifted to ocean or, or, or seagoing vessels. In other words, what, what they were doing in the Middle Ages is they had castles. And when the enemy attacked, everybody would go inside the castle, climb up above the, the invading force, and then shoot down on them and pour boiling water on them and all that kind of stuff. Well, when they went to sea, they did the same thing. They built a castle at the beginning of the vessel and a castle at the stern of the vessel. And when they were boarded by a, an enemy force, everybody retreated into those castles, climbed up to the top, shot down on them with bow and arrow, or eventually with, uh, with guns, and they would pour boiling water on them and so forth. It was the same thing. But if you've got a vessel and you've got a great big tall castle up here and a great big tall castle here, is it going to have very good sailing quality? No, it is not, absolutely not. So little by slowly, those castles came down. This is a Karak. Let me see what have I got to go here. So there, folks, that's where that name comes from. Then? Yeah, the forecastle. Sorry, I meant to mention that to you. Yep, the forecastle is the forecastle, and the aftercastle just became uh, the stern. This is a, a battle right here with a number of different kinds of vessels on it. Um, but this great big one over here, this is a Karak again, and you can see that. This thing uh, was sailed, the smaller one right here, they were sailed with square sails. But are those sails actually square? That's a trick question. They're not square. They're kind of an odd trapezoidal uh, design. So if that's the case, why did they call them square sails? Why did they call the ships that, that carried them square sailors? Anybody know? Have you ever thought about that? They called them square sailors because the, the sails, the, the main sails on them, um, if there were no wind, they would hang 90 degrees to the direction the ship was pointed. They'd make a square angle right there. They were transverse. They crossed the deck from port to starboard. So um, that's where the term square sailor came in. And these guys were square sailors. The boat on the right, more like the Mediterranean design. Um, uh, yeah, this one over here, this is a galley. I had in, uh, included galleys in this talk this morning and then I dropped out most of the slides because galleys were pretty, pretty much particular and they didn't follow the same path uh, of development that the square sailors did. So I kind of uh, reduced this to square sailors. But indeed, these things worked very well in the Mediterranean all the way up to the 1700s. They were more rowboats. They were rowboats. And as they were rowboats, they're just in, in concept, they're just the same as the way the ancient Greeks did it with their triremes. What was the firepower on a trireme? How did they how did they fight way back in, in the Battle of Salamis and whatnot? They rammed them. That's exactly right. They had a big bronze plow on it. They got up ahead of steam. And if they could, they would T-bone the enemy ship. And then they would jump on and they would fight it out. I used to start my naval history class with a clip from the old movie of Ben-Hur when, who is it, Charleston Heston? Charlton Heston is is uh, chained to the to the uh, to the oar, and he somehow manages to to survive and go on to great things. But this was uh, it wasn't strictly Mediterranean, but it was primarily Mediterranean. And the French uh, and the Venetians continued to build these, as I say, well well into the 1700s, and they were as bestial as the stories are. Many tales that people could smell them coming from a long ways away. These guys were not volunteers. They were for the most part enslaved people or people who had no choice. One of the most famous of whom was Cervantes, the guy who wrote Don Quixote. Another one was John Smith, the guy who did Jamestown and all of that. 
he was also captured and put into the galleys. And both of those guys survived, although if you read about life on them, you wonder how anybody did. Uh, in any event, yeah, that's a southern, strictly a southern tradition. I've got a couple more. Uh, this is a lovely uh, Barocco print that we actually have that in our collection. Um, and it shows Icarus sailing too close to the sun. But basically, that is a lovely picture of a Karak. And so they had Karaks, they, they had them in the south, and they had them in the north. Um, the Spanish had them, Portuguese had them but so did the English and the French and the Dutch. Now, the thing that, that, uh, that Rick alluded to in his opening remarks was how close could these things sail uh, toward the wind? Uh, and with those great square sails on them, um, that's as close as they could get. If the wind is coming down from above, that's as close as they could get on a square sailor uh, to the direction of the wind which is not very close. Better than a catamaran. Better than what you, you pointed at about, you know, straight across. They could get a, that much if they were good and they knew how to do it. Um, uh, as you can see, I think you can read this under here. Um, the way they did it uh, in the age of sail, um, they, they divided uh, a circle into 32 equal parts and um as you can read again i'm going to just see this here uh all the different points of sale um that you got um and you'll see that they can't really get very close to the wind what do they call the highest point yeah yeah what do they call the highest point of sale i don't know um can anybody help out with that because right, you're asking in terms of close close, close reach, hauled. close hall right yeah oh yeah. close hauled yeah um close uh number one is close hauled that's out here and out here number two is one point large number three is two points large <laughs> um, number four is three points large, and number five is four points large, and number six is five points large. Yeah, you do. <laughs> number seven, six points large, wind on the quarter. Number eight is three points on the quarter. That's what they called that point of sale. Number nine, two points on the quarter, and 10 is one point on the quarter, and 11 is before the wind down here. So each one of those had a different name. And that's how they referred to them. And everybody knew or learned right away what that meant. That answered that reasonably well? Rick, I want to start teaching that here. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Um, I, might, I might divert just for a moment. You guys are in a school right here. And in some ways, your school here is like the Naval Academy. In that, you're learning about sailing in a building that's on land. And you're in a classroom, and you're learning about various things on sail in a classroom setting. And then you go out to the boats, and you put that into practice. At the Naval Academy, they do more or less the same thing. They study for nine months and then they go out into the fleet over the summer for basically two months and they get a month off. Um, but when they established the Naval Academy in 1845, everybody went, you're going to do what? You're going to try to teach people how to sail modern ships in 1845 by putting them into a classroom on land? How had they done it since the Greeks? All along for a thousand, two thousand years, how did they do it? You learn by doing. You didn't get any classroom instruction. Um, if it were in peacetime, you could volunteer into the service. And typically, when people, men, started in 
um, uh, upon a naval career, I know the English and the French ones and the Dutch ones. Um, they would find a place aboard a ship. Usually somebody knew the captain. There was a lot of personal relations going on. And um, he would stay on board. Eventually, if the captain liked him, he could make him a, a he could get a commission as a midshipman. And when did they start off? When they went to sea, how old were they? Actually, nine is the earliest, the youngest one that I found. Who went to sea when he was nine years old? Farragut did. That's right, David Farragut. Goodbye, Dad. Goodbye, Mom. I'm off to make a man of myself. I'm nine years old. Damn the torpedoes. Exactly right. That's pretty young. Uh, but 11 and 12 and 13 is not. And so these men of war were actually crawling with children on occasion. Um, and if the captain cared about it, he would teach them the ropes, good naval term. And if he didn't care about it, then they were basically left to their own uh, devices and it took them longer to learn what was going on. That was all done at sea. What caused the Naval Academy to be founded and opened here on land in 1845? What major development out there made the old way of doing it a little obsolete? Steam power did. Absolutely. Steam power. Because steam power takes an engine to run it. And an engine takes an engineer to run it. And somebody out there must have thought, well, you know, They've had steam engines since what, 1768? I think that's when Watt did his thing. The early engines on them were just terrible. What kind of fuel did they use, the earliest engines in the late 1700s? Wood. Ah, it was wood, just wood. It was the worst uh, um, uh, fuel. Do you think those early steam engines that they put on ships worked perfectly? I imagine they spent more downtime than uptime. And the Navy said, we don't want anything to do with that. But by the 1840s, the US Navy said, well, maybe, maybe now they're getting more, more uh, efficient. And there were, uh, well, that, that basically drove uh, the experiment here to start a school on land so that they could study steam engineering and they could study uh, hydro, dynamics and thermodynamics and all of that business. So that's why that happened. But uh, that was, that's a, a diversion there. But when they went to sea, they had to learn all the points of sail. And on those square sailors, they could only get uh, uh, moderately close to the direction of the wind. Now in the South, in the Mediterranean, a different kind of vessel was developed the, is that a square sail? It's got, it's a triangular sail, right? Is it a four, uh, is it a square sail? It has nothing to do with the shape of the, of the, of the sail. That's what I'm saying again. It's, well, it does. And they could, they could, they could pivot that, but it's still a four and a half sail. And there's one from, I forget when that's from, but it's about um, 1800s, 1450. Uh, this was a prototype uh, that developed into something called a caravel. And there's a three-masted one. That one's just a single-masted one. And you can see the, um, uh, at this time, it didn't have a rudder. It just had this extra, uh, uh, or thrust over the starboard quarter. And what did they call this? They called it the steer board. So what did that give rise to? There you go. Um, there's one with three masts. Uh, there's one with three masts uh, from 1516. And look at the advantage. The yellow one is the square sailor. The red arrows there show that these caravels could get a lot closer to the wind than the square sailors could um, with their fore and aft sails. 
there was a guy named Prince Henry the Navigator. Sounds like a mythical character, but he was real. Um, and he sent out expeditions one after another from Portugal, and they worked their way down the west coast of Africa, getting closer and closer the, uh, to, the, to the Cape here. But what was the trick? The trick wasn't getting down here. The trick was getting back again. And square sailors couldn't do this. They could get down there, but they couldn't get back again because they couldn't sail against the wind um, efficiently. Eventually, Diaz got all the way down to the end and then turned and came back. When they did that, you know, it's something I have to emphasize with the mids because they're not used to this unless they're on the sailing program. These ships were totally dependent on the wind and the currents for their, for their propulsion, if you will. And the currents were big time, so they had to follow these things and go all around in order to get back again. You can kind of follow this um, uh, when they would get all the way down here, then they would sail back to this up to here and sail back home again. You could do that with a ship that was rigged with that fore and aft sail. I forgot to tell you what it's called. It's called a Latin sail, L-A-T-E-E-N for Latin for the Mediterranean. Um, uh, da Gama followed Diaz. He made it all the way over essentially to the Horn of Africa and then um, crossed the Indian Ocean and the rest was history there. And he, he had to get back as well. Say again? Pardon me, Rob. Did, did hmm? you finish your thought? Then? Yeah, go ahead. So do the caramels have a, any type of like uh, Southeast Asian influence at all? It, they sort of, I think it's called like Junk? Some of the, the, no, it's it's called. I think you're thinking of a Dow. Oh, is that what it is? Okay, it's a right. Dow. Similar. I mean, not yeah. Exactly. I so I don't know who input. No, they, I would imagine these were influenced by the Dows. Uh, okay. I hadn't actually thought about that, but I did get to Zanzibar one time, and I looked out on the water, and boy, I thought I was living in 500 A.D. because they're just plowing the the uh, the horizon, just like they always did. That was really, that was really fun. I, I think there must have been an influence there. So, I just a, a question. So, the Latin sail, which is uh, a little bit more like that sloop rigged uh, yeah. model that we are diagramming so. and showed. When did, did the concept of lift, though, uh, come in? Was it ever written about? Only in that when I looked at that with that, that spar, which is very hard um, on the, uh, uh, what I guess we would think is the luff of the sail, it, it, yeah. it doesn't look like the sail could shape very much to create that differential between, uh, you know, high pressure and low pressure. All of the pictures that you see, the paintings and whatnot, show those sails billow oh, way okay. out, you know. So I think a lot of those are a little bit of artistic license. Um, but they, they, they did hang with a, a, a great bulbous shape um, in, the early, in the early period, for sure. Uh, we come up here with a, uh, a mix of square sails and Latin sails. There's another one with three masts on it. They did make these with four masts. Uh, that's a replica of, uh, you know, the Nina and the Pinta were both um, caravels and the Santa Maria was a carac. But they cheated a little bit by putting square sails on a caravel, which gave it another name, a caravel Radonda, and everybody knew what that meant. Uh, if um, if they were, if they proved advantageous, so they could re-rig these basically on the on the go if they needed to. And another one, and another one, all mixed uh, with the uh, mix of Latin sails toward the stern and square sails up forward. This one, you could look at that. 
that's from about Henry the seventh time. And you could tell that this is this is different. For one thing, different from a from a um, a caravel certainly, but also different from a carac, in that it's got this great jutting prow out here, and then the forecastle is is um, offset toward the stern. And this is a this is a mark of a of a galleon. That's what they called them. So both of the castles had been way sh uh, cut down from the carax. And um, this is again from the time of uh, Drake and so forth. There's all kinds. Everybody made them. Galleons proved to be uh, quite useful with a mix. This one has four sails on it. It's the stern most uh, mast that was eventually done away with. But they had them in the north, they had them in the south. Of course, the Spanish galleons that you're always hearing about. Here's one from Belgium again. And another, and still another. And again, you can see the shape of the sails as depicted here by uh, this character from about 1600. So we're just getting close. The Spanish tended to make them quite large. The English made them smaller. They called them race built so that they were faster than the Spanish. They did get into it with these great big Spanish caracs and, and the much smaller uh, English galleons there. Fought a number of times. That's a beautiful painting of a galleon from one side and same artist did the other side as well. And then we're just here when we start, those were, these are from uh, Dutch painters. And of course the Dutch revolutionized painting with their seascapes. Yes, sir. I, I, yeah. Um, Basically, how did these square sailors uh, deal with sailing into the wind or tacking when they had to? I, I meant to bring a book. There's a book uh, by a fellow named John Harlan, a Canadian who just passed away. And it details all of the instructions that it took that the captain or the master or his lieutenants had to learn. And, and then they had to whip that crew into shape to, to follow their commands. And a simple tack on an easy day had about 40 steps to it with releasing certain lines, dropping sails, raising sails, and trying to make, make it get all the way through the wind instead of not making it. And then they're in irons and then they're in a mess. But the simplest maneuvers took, like I say, 40 iterations or, or thereabouts before they, they actually did it. And that's what they trained on these things. It's not efficient. A lot of ships, they, you know, they tried to attack and they couldn't make it. Um, and the best crewed ships could do it better than the worst crewed ships. So that's kind of a wishy-washy answer, but. Trying to pivot that, is it the yard arm or the bar? I forget what the name is. The yards, yeah. The yards are pivoting. Them. Oh, they do pivot. Absolutely, they pivot. Right, but sometimes when they pivoted, they had to drop certain lines yeah. that were in the way and, and so forth, yeah. And two things, uh, Francis, you might uh, mention then. One, I mean, how, I showed an illustration of a very simple set of lines. You have a, a jib sheet and a main sheet. And so how many lines would a boat have to, to, uh, to execute these kind of difficult procedures then? They had miles of, of, of lines on them. Um, how many lines? There are many, many, uh, somewhere in here, I have a diagram of the lines. Let me not jump in. But, but anyway, I think it, it's just, just interesting in terms of complexity. Oh, seriously uh, complex, I guarantee you. Um, this is the ship that I use to start off my class, the ship model I use. It's, uh, this is the Sovereign of the Seas of 1637. And A, it doesn't belong to us, it's on loan. And B, 
it's not a dockyard model. So I extol the virtues of dockyard models and so forth to the mids, and then I start my class, class off with a model that's not a dockyard model, because that represents the ship from 1637, but the model wasn't built until 1918. So in effect, this is the model maker's best guess at what that old ship looked like. There, she was very famous, so she was painted all the time. And there's, uh, there's a couple of plans from her and so forth. Um, but I use this to show a couple of things. One reason I use it is because it's got sails on it. And most of the dockyard models don't. Even if they did when they were built 250 years ago, they have frittered away. Um, but this one, which is now, it occurred to me the other day that this is now over a century old. Uh, it's got all the sails on it. So I go through the square sail and the fore and aft sail and so forth with the kids. I show them the Sovereign of the Seas was a, was a groundbreaking ship that set the standard for other ships for a couple of hundred years. Um, just like Constitution, for example, but when Constitution finally got into battle in the War of 1812, it made all the other frigates on the high seas obsolete, just like that. And why is that? The thick hull? The thick hull, yeah, old iron sides, but that's not really what I'm going at. Um, it had to do with the weight of the cannons on it and the number of cannons. Until she was built, the largest frigates on the high seas um, carried 38 guns, and each uh, and the guns in the main battery were 18 pounders, which meant that the cannonball, the solid iron hunk of uh, iron, uh, weighed um, 32 pounds, and um, they they would uh, place these incredibly heavy guns down on the lowest of the decks. This one is a three decker, one, two, and three decks, an upper deck, a middle deck, and a lower deck. You can see that. So she was the first. Frank, you want to point it out? Oh yeah, I'm sorry. <laughs> You've got an upper deck, a lower deck, a, a middle deck, and a lower deck. And when I talk about one, two, or three decks. I'm only talking about the decks that are fully armed and run from bow to stern. We're not talking about the forecastle, the forecastle, or the quarter deck, or the, the poop deck, or so forth. When you're talking about a ship being a single deck, or a two deck, or a three deck, or it's only the fully armed decks from bow to stern. And Sovereign of the Seas is the first three decker that was armed with a hundred cannons. She was the second three deck, but the first one just had about 50 guns on it and really went nowhere. But this one with three full decks and a hundred guns on her set the stage for all of the biggest ships afloat in the age of sail, which were three deckers, all the way up to the end of the age of sail, almost certainly through Trafalgar in 1815. So she's built in 1637. But if you compared her with Victory, Victory's bigger, but all of the basics that are in Victory came from the Sovereign of the Seas. What was another one of those groundbreaking ships where she, she rendered all her competitors obsolete as soon as she got her bottom wet? The Dreadnought. She was so revolutionary that all the ships they built before her gained the name pre-Dreadnoughts. So um, that was a, a very revolutionary ship. The Constitution was a very revolutionary ship. And the Sovereign of the Seas was a very um, revolutionary ship. And by the way, I can say that everybody who advised the king, it was England's Charles I, said, don't build this ship. You're nuts if you try to build a ship that big. First of all, she'll be so big that we'll never get her into a harbor. You'll have to park her way out in the roads and then use smaller vessels to transport back and forth. You'll never find a crew. It took 800 men to man this thing. You'll never find a crew 
to man it and then be able to manage the crew. Um, it's, it's just too unwieldy, terrible idea. He said, I don't care. I'm Charles I. I want a ship equal to my magnificence. And so they spent uh, so much money on her in those days prior to Charles I, only the seaport towns in England paid a Navy tax, if you will. But just the decoration on this thing was so expensive that they had to tax every town in England. Then they had a civil war in the 1640s. It was as nasty as our civil war that pitted mem uh, people who wanted members of parliament to run the government versus those who wanted the king to run the government. And who lost? The king lost. And what happened to the king when he lost? They chopped his head off. It wasn't only the French who did it, the English showed him how a long time earlier than that. And a lot of people said that uh, one reason they chopped his head off is because he irritated so many Englishmen who had to pay that damn Navy tax to pay for the decoration. And why the decoration? Did it have a function? Did it have a purpose on all of these ships? This wooden, often gilded, actually gilded in gold? No, it didn't. Basically, it didn't. It was just to show off the might and majesty of the monarchy that could throw away money like that on decorating the ships. They were a floating propaganda item as well as a gun platform. So Sovereign of the Seas was big time. And I, uh, I say she's got three masts, a four mast, a main mast, a foremost and a mainmast, and then um, oops, a foremost and a mainmast, and the aftermost uh, after mast was called a mizzen mast, M-I-Z-E-N or Z-Z-E-N. And from it, this one has a square sail on it, but beneath it, it's got this long diagonal yard right here, and the sail is furled on the yard, but if they unfurled it, it would drop down into a triangular shaped sail that was a, uh, a square sail? No, it's a fore and aft sail. This is the mix again, that um, uh, it shows the mix of the Northern and the Southern building traditions from the Middle Ages in that they put a fore and aft um, sail uh, up here, uh, or back here on the mizzen mist. Uh, early on, they had square sails up here at the end of the bowsprit, but they eventually did away with those and replaced them with fore and aft sails like jibs. They were jibs. So, uh, Brian, with fore and aft sails as well as uh, the squared sails, in case you have a lot of control over this direction with the sail, you can see the rudder on this. Yeah. Can you comment on whether they use the, the rudder, the sails to direct the rudder? Yeah. Uh, I'm picked up in your opening remarks that you sail that you direct these things a lot with the rudder. The rudder really plays a huge role in it, much less so on these big ships. That's a very small rudder compared to the size of the ship and, and the weight of the thing and so forth. So they steered these things. They tended to steer them more with the sails than with, um, with the wheel. And by the way, the wheel had to be invented and it wasn't invented until about the year 1700, but sometime in the 1690s. Before that, they had ships before the 1690s. How did they steer them? Well, it was something that was attached to the tiller, just like a wheel is attached to the tiller. But in this case, it's called a whip staff, W-H-I-P-S-T-A-F-F. -F, and it was just a single timber that was high, taller than the helmsman, and he stood behind it. And the bottom of the thing on the deck he was, he was standing on, the tiller went through a hole in that and went down another deck and attached to the fore end of the tiller with a metal plate that sort of looked like a uh, that, whatever you call that. Um, 
and the, the helmsman could stand behind the till, uh, behind the whip staff, and he couldn't even see the sails because he was down below decks. But somebody would shout down to him, hard and port, you know. And so he would take that thing and he could push it down or lift it a bit, making the tiller go a little bit like so with the rudder back here. And he would throw it over to, to port or he would throw it over to starboard. And the rudder would go, oop, or oop, not a lot. The, the whip staff worked. But it, it, it had a whole lot of limitations because it didn't have much of a mechanical advantage to it. Somebody finally in about the about 1700 thought, well, the whip staff has no ropes on it. It's just a, a timber that's attached with a metal fitting to the fore end of the tiller. When the wheel came into being, the shape of the wheel had nothing to do with it. What made the wheel important is the ropes. Because on a wheel, you've got a barrel, and you've got the wheel that's at a 90 degree angle to that. And around that barrel are the tiller ropes. And they go down through the deck, and they attach to the fore end of the tiller. Only now, instead of pushing it over and uh, to one side or the other, by turning the wheel, you actually wind the rudder up uh, out toward the uh, the sides of the ship, and you could get a lot more out of that rudder. You could you could swing it through a much greater arc with a wheel than you could with the whip staff. And again, with the whip staff, the helmsman was normally down below decks and normally couldn't see the sails. But with a, uh, with a wheel, because it's attached to the uh, tiller by ropes, you could just make the ropes longer and move the whole wheel up a deck. Move it from the upper deck to the quarter deck. And who's prowling on the quarter deck? The captain. So it, it brought the, the, uh, the steering mechanism within range of the captain and vice versa. So it was a, it was a big improvement but we do have a, a contemporary book from 1719 with a bunch of blank contracts in it, how to build a ship in 1719. And the blank contract, uh, um, I noticed one day that they called for both a wheel and a whip staff. And why was that? Because they didn't trust the wheel. That's, <laughs> they knew the whip staff worked. They weren't so sure about the wheel. And there is also a replica ship that plies these waters that is fitted with a whip staff because it represents a really old ship from 1634. That's 1637, isn't it? 1634? The Kalmar Nickel. Anybody know the Kalmar Nickel? Oh, she's home ported just up in Baltimore. And uh, she brought the first settlers to Delaware, if I remember, it made several Atlantic crossings. It's, it's, so it's a small vessel. 1634, they're still pretty small, but you can steer that thing with a whip staff, which is really a trip. If you ever get a chance, the Calvar Nickel starts with a K and she bought, she was Swedish. Yeah. So, um, so this one doesn't have a whip staff on it. It has a, uh, it has a wheel. Oh no, it doesn't. It's got a whip staff on it, but it has a rudder that is center hung. I told you, how did they steer the earliest of these ships? Starboard? Steerboard, with the steerboard, which is off to one side. Somebody in Northern Europe thought, well, you know, maybe we could, we could steer it by moving the rudder onto the center line and then maneuvering it, not with the guy on the, on the steerboard, but uh, with the whip staff, which is a lot safer for the helmsman. He's not going to get shot down there. Make sense? Yeah. Okay. Um, that's some of the decoration. This is a Cracker Jack model, by the way. I wish we owned it. I hope the guys who've loaned it to us will give it to us. I think they may, they may well. Um, when they fought, the Sovereign of the Seas essentially 
uh, opens the era to the sailing man of war. To, in the classic uh, tradition, and they brought these ships together in combat, basically between 1650 and 1675. And during that period, the English and the Dutch fought three wars, not one, not two, but three. And they were so evenly matched that the English won the first Anglo-Dutch war, the Dutch won the second Anglo-Dutch war, and the third one was pretty much of a toss up. But each time the, the peace settled, New York became New Amsterdam, became New York, became New Amsterdam. If there'd have been a fourth war, we'd probably all be speaking Dutch today. Okay. So when they came into battle, the English and the Dutch, in the, the, this period, in the, the middle 17th century, the battle almost immediately devolved into a series of mini battles on the sea surface all over everywhere. And uh, this is called a melee, melee being a French word for fight. Um, as I say, all of these are, oops, all of these are individual battles that are going on. Now, let's say you are the fleet commander right there. You maneuver your fleet to get, you, get it where you want it, and then you blow the whistle and everybody goes to battle. Once they start shooting, what happens? They were shooting black powder. So the air filled up with smoke like nobody's business. They're loud as the devil. So after a couple of volleys, everybody's essentially deaf or their heads are ringing. And the question becomes, once the fighting started, how did the commander in chief continue to uh, control his fleet? He could, nobody could see, nobody could hear. So that's kind of a trick question. Once the battle started, the commander lost control of his fleet. And it all devolved down onto individual ship's captains. Not only that, but in each one of these little mini battles around here, um, the idea was to find one enemy ship and to surround him with as many of your ships as possible and pound him from all angles. They would do this in theory so that one ship would come up alongside the enemy, loose a volley of cannon fire into it, and then sail out of the way and kind of do a figure eight and come back and do it again with several ships. But again, these guys are totally dependent on the wind and the currents and the whip staff. And what you ended up with more often than not was something like that where a bunch of ships would surround an enemy ship and pound it from all angles. But in this case, look what part of the ships are firing into the enemy, which is a much bigger ship. But what part of the, the English ships in this case is pointed toward the enemy? The bow or the stern, they could, they could end up getting the stern in there. Is that what they wanted to do? No, it isn't what they wanted to do, but these things are very hard to control. And very often, oh, that's why I did that. The weakest part of one of these ships is the bow. The, the second weakest part of it structurally is the stern, in large part because of the quarter galleries here, which are just a terrible drag on uh, the, the, the main hull. And so the, the weakest part structurally are the bow and the stern, and they were the most lightly armed part of the ship. By the time Sovereign of the Seas was built, people had figured out that instead of just putting cannons up on the top deck here, you could actually punch a hole in the ship's side and put a cannon there. How do you think that idea went over initially? Huh. You're going to do what? Uh, but eventually they figured out how to do it. And so 
90 some odd percent of the firepower of all of these sailing men of war was arranged on the broadsides. And by the way, I'll just mention this now because I'm thinking of it. This ship took about 800 men, uh, uh, had a crew of about 800 men, but they could have sailed this guy with 200 men, with one fourth of that crew. So why did they carry so many people? To command the cannon. To command the guns, exactly. Mids are on, I don't know. To command the guns, exactly. Because these guns could take 10 or even 12 people per gun. And if you got 100 guns, you better have a pretty big crew in order to man at least all the guns on one side of the ship and hope that your skipper doesn't get you sandwiched between two enemy ships because then you were in a pickle. And uh, mm -hmm. uh, just one thing, you had mentioned that the Admiral be surrounded by ships and there'd be smoke and couldn't see. Yeah. Um, when uh, did communication signal flags come into play um, and how important were they in terms of battle? In 1951, the Naval Academy got a bequest, just like the ship models from Colonel Rogers in 1935. In 1951, a guy died and he gave us his collection, his private collection of signal books through the ages. And everybody at the time seemed to think that this was the third most important collection in the world, the first two being in England. And it's, a, it's got 300 some odd books in it and they detail um, the history of the development of signal flags. Initially, what was, this, what was the first signal flag? Can you think? No, nope. <laughs> nope, neither one, not surrender or attack. No, they, it was so crude, the signals and so forth were so crude that they couldn't spell out, England expects every man to do his duty. They just put the, the national flag at the top of the mainmast. And what that meant was all the ship's captains get into a boat and row over to the main ship to the, uh, and have a little parley with the, with the admiral where he would hand out his instructions. Because in, in a melee, once the fighting started, they all better know what, what, what to do. The problem with the melee is that very often you ended up with the lightest armed part and the weakest structural part of a ship uh, attacking the enemy. Is that, is that ideal? Clearly not. So something had to be done about that. It started with rates. And it was again the Brits who did it, who invented the rating system just about the time Sovereign of the Seas was built. Um, where if, if I were going to just read what's on here, you can read it, I hope, up there. But basically speaking, in the 1640s, the English figured out a way of classifying their ships based on the number of guns and the number of decks. And they developed it in the 1640s, and they were still using it in 1804 and, and well into the 19th century. Here you can see a print of a view of the Royal Navy of Great Britain in the year 1804. So that's what the Navy looked like in 1804. And it had 600, oh, I can't quite read it. 726, I'm sorry, 726 ships. And you can get it all onto one piece of paper. And that's because they had developed this classification system of first rate, second rates, third rates, fourth rates, fifth and sixth rates. And if you look closer at these, the, the pictures of the ships are sort of anatomically correct in that they've got the right number of gun decks on them. And um, they've all got three vertical masts. I, I kind of skipped this. When I got to the Sovereign of the Seas, I asked my midshipmen generally, is that a ship? And they all look at me like, that's a trick question. <laughs> um, it is a ship, but you know, in the age of sail, well, well, today, let's say we look out on the horizon, maybe you guys don't because you're sailors now, but 
uh, most people would look out on the horizon and say, well, there's a ship out there. But in the age of sail, they didn't have a blanket term for everything that floated called a ship. In order for a vessel to be a ship, it had to have, it had to meet certain criteria. It had to have three vertical masts. It could have four, but I say the fourth one went away. But if it had only two masts, they'd never call it a ship. If it had only one mast, they'd never call that a ship. It had to have three vertical masts. It had to have square sails on the foremast and mainmast, and it had to have a Latin sail on the mizzen mast. If it didn't have those things, they didn't call it a ship. They'd call it a brig, a brigantine, a yacht, a schooner, a sloop, what have you. But, no, but in order for it to be a ship, it had to meet those, those criteria. And all of these six rates, the ships in those six rates were all ships. And because they were all ships, they were all commanded by a captain. When you got promoted to captain of the Royal Navy in the age of sail, you didn't get a desk job. You got a ship. And um, they have first, second, third, fourth, fifth, and sixth rates. You can see that, if you could see this closer, the first rates have three gun decks, just like Sovereign of the Seas. This is 1804. They're still building them like Sovereign of the Seas. Three gun decks. And each one of these images here has a little code, like 4264G, 4100G, or 3, well, you can't read that, 36G. What does that mean? Well, the G means guns. The second number, uh, says how many guns that ship carried. And the first number says how many of that kind of ship were in the Royal Navy in 1804. So you can see, given that, that first and second rates were three deckers, two deckers were either third or fourth rates, and single deckers were fifth and sixth rates. All ships, and even the smallest, the sixth rate 20s or sixth rate 18s, um, compared to these big first rates up here, they were like toys. But for you and me, these are still big ships. And you ha still had to have 10, 15 years under your belt before you got command. Before that, as a lieutenant or even a midshipman, you sailed these guys. Are these ships? You see which ones I was pointing at there? The lowest, probably not. Right? No, they're not because they don't have three mass and they're not vertical and, or maybe not vertical and maybe not have a Latin on them, what have you. These smaller unrated vessels were command, <coughs> commanded by lieutenants. And when you were uh, commissioned a lieutenant, eventually uh, you would start off as like a sixth lieutenant on a great big ship or a second lieutenant on a much smaller one and when you'd commanded one of these successfully, when, a, when an opening here, somebody died, retired, what have you, um, these guys would be promoted to captain and they would get command of one of these rated vessels, almost always a sixth rate or a fifth rate. And then as time went on, if you proved yourself and people kept dying, they would keep moving until they were commanding the big first rate. So Today we've referred to something that's of low quality as in its third rate. Um, yeah. Does that do, do those uh, adages or aphorisms do they come from the, the ship rating system? Not to my knowledge. Uh, you could be on a second rate ship, and it's still a magnificent ship. It's got between uh, ninety and ninety-eight guns. It's got three gun decks, a huge crew. The only thing is, it's not as quite as big as a first rate and it's not as luxurious because these things had to be outfitted to, to uh, uh, deal with an admiral and all his retinue and so forth. And they just made them plusher in the first rates than the second, but it doesn't mean they're not as good. They're just not quite as big and not quite as powerful. That's a good question though. Um, so we've got the entire uh, Royal Navy in this one uh, image here, 
And you also have all of the, the ranks of different people who commanded these, there's captains and admirals, but there's also a rank in there called a master and commander. You know the movie, Master and Commander? Have you seen it? That's a rank. It was like you are Lieutenant such and such, you're Captain such and such, and you're Master and Commander such and such. Eventually they broke that into the Master and the Commander. But it, at this time, just like the Aubrey Maturin, uh, I'm sorry? Uh, Post commander means a captain. Yeah, yeah. Um, and they also had the rank of commodore, but that's a that's a temporary command of a group of ships. Uh, and when the mission was over, he re was reduced back down to captain again. So, I have no idea why they changed the kind of cool name Commodore to Rear Admiral second half. Lower half. What, lower half. I mean, it sounds black. I, everybody likes Commodore better, but uh, I don't know why they did that. It seems like an odd choice to me. Yeah, maybe that's it. Maybe that's it. And Ensign, uh, pardon me, and Ensign didn't come on scene yet? No. You mentioned several times. No, not, no, later that, that's later on, yeah. Okay, I told you earlier that the melee type of warfare had all kinds of problems with it. The major one being that the commander lost control of his forces as soon as the fighting started. And if you had ship, good ship's captains, you might win. If you had lousy ship's captains, you might lose. But um, it, was, it was rendered obsolete, the melee type of uh, fighting in those Anglo-Dutch wars. I told you the English won the first Anglo-Dutch war, and that's because they jettisoned the melee type of warfare first and developed the line ahead formation in which the ships were lined up when they uh, went into battle, they were lined up like ducks in a row, bow to stern, bow to stern. Now, in the line of battle or the line ahead or the line in the 1780s, that's the 1780s, the earlier one we looked at was the 1670s. Something happened between that time and this time. When they lined up into a line of battle and put everybody into his place in the line, they didn't just do it willy nilly. Early on, from the very beginning, the English determined that the best way to, to maintain command was to divide the line up into three squadrons, a front squadron, a middle squadron, and a back squadron. The commander in chief would choose the biggest, plushest first rate and make that his flagship. And he positioned himself when they went into battle in the middle of the middle squadron. So he's got half his ships in front of him, half his ships uh, behind him. The only thing is they didn't call the middle squadron the, the middle squadron, they called it the center. So he put himself right in the middle of the line of battle in the center squadron, in the center of the center squadron. Then he would take his vice admiral, his number two guy, like the vice president, and he'd put him in charge of the front squadron. But they didn't call it the front squadron, they called it the van, which was short for vanguard. That makes sense, right? And he'd put uh, in the van, he'd put half his ships in front of him and half his ships behind him. And then the commander in chief would take his third in command and put him in charge of the back squadron. But they didn't call it the back squadron, they called it the rear squadron. So that guy became known as the rear, rear admiral. That's where that comes from. Now, in the 1780s, in a line of battle, the smoke is just as smoky as it ever was, it's still black powder. If anything, there's more of it because the cannon got a lot bigger in the interim, and they were certainly just as loud as they'd ever been. So when the battle commenced and the smoke got up here and you couldn't see the flags anymore because by the 1780s, they had developed a lot of flag signals, 
but most of them were used before the battle started so that they could get lined up the way the commander in chief wanted them. So if the smoke is just as smoky and the noise is just as deafening, how did the commander in chief who's in the middle of the center squadron there, how did he command his fleet once the battle had commenced? Nope, he did. That's why this is so much better than the other system. He did it because of this guy. Oh, 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 wrong one. This guy. And over here, these guys. This ship is a smaller ship that belongs to this fleet, the Dutch fleet, and it's going to be, well, first of all, is it going to be targeted by the English, by the enemy? No, it's not, because it's hiding behind the, its own line. So these guys couldn't shoot this guy, but what he could do, he could uh, come a, a uh, alongside the commander in chief, get his orders, and then he could sail up to the van and relay those orders, sail back to the to the rear, give those orders and so forth. And if somebody became disabled in the line, he could pull them out of the line of battle and everybody else would just scooch up. So once the battle commenced in the line of battle era, the commander in chief did not lose command of his fleet. Yes, ma'am. They were. One of the problems in the melee is that just when a ship was ready to uh, fire upon the enemy, one of his own guys would drift into the way. Happened more often than it didn't happen. Is that going to happen here? Not if you stick it to your place in the line of battle. It won't happen. You won't get one of these guys drifting into the middle here if he can manage it. Did Once the battle started and he had lost all his lines and his sails fell down and the mast went over, he might drift in there, but then he's in a pickle. The idea was stay in your assigned place and do what the Admiral was telling you relayed by this smaller ship out here. These ships, by the way, Keep point on right here. these ships, by the way, got a name, ship of the line. And the ships of the line were first, were first rates, second rates, third rates, and fourth rates. If you ranged up with one of these fourth rates, which had, let's say, 50 guns on it, and you ranged up against a first rate in the enemy line with 100 guns on it, who's going to win? Hmm. Well, you know the bigger ship is going to win. It's going to win for three reasons. One is that it had more guns. Two is that the guns it had were bigger than the guns, bigger and heavier than the guns on the smaller vessel. And uh, three, the, the bigger vessel is higher off the water, so you can get on the decks and shoot down on the enemy decks, which is a lot easier than trying to shoot up at the enemy. So there's three reasons why a first rate would blow a fourth rate out of the water. And they're going, th these two fleets could be going in the same direction on the same tack, or they could be coming like this. If they're coming like this on opposite tacks, are you going to arrive at, the, at a time when that fourth rate is in fact ranged up against a, a first rate? It's inevitable, you will. And too bad for the smaller ship. Just get, get away as fast as you can. Uh, but that was acceptable. Uh, th those were the tactics. Ships of the line, first, second, third, and fourth rates. And too bad for the small fourth rates who had to take on a much bigger ship. But if the two-decker fourth rates we're in danger of getting blown out of the water by a bigger enemy ship. What about the fifth and sixth rates? These guys, they're single deckers. They've got a, a, maybe as few as 20 guns, no more than 38. 
How did they protect them from getting blown out of the water in a line of battle engagement? Jeez. Nope, although they were faster. But everybody in the fleet sailed as fast as the slowest ship, which was usually the fleet flagship. And throughout the age of sail, they never really got much better. How fast could a big first rate sailing man of war sail under ideal conditions, perfect weather and currents? How fast could they go? Six knots. Six knots. These big behemoth first rates with these huge cannon, they weighed so much and they had this enormous crew on them and so forth. Most they could do was six knots. So how fast did everybody sail? Six knots. Now, the first, second, third, and fourth rates are in the line. The way they protected the fifth and sixth rates is they didn't put them in the line because they weren't line of battle ships. They were a different kind of ship. And what was that called? Starts with a C, ends with cruisers. There you go. They're cruisers, and they've got a different mission. What's one of their missions? Communication. They're the guys who are out here relaying all this, all of the signals and whatnot. What else? Uh, and the fifth and sixth rates, the most famous of them are called frigates, and there's a complicated reason why, but take it from me. All frigates were cruisers, not all cruisers were frigates, but basically speaking, they're too small to hold their own in a line of battle, so they never put them in the line of battle. They gave them different missions. This being one of them, what, what are these frigates most famous for, other than the frigate-to-frigate -frigate duels, which are so much fun to read about and probably weren't much fun to participate in? Um, raiding? Raiding what? Merchant ships merchant ships what that i can imagine that every ship's captain of a frigate got down on his knees every night and prayed for london that said captain you're now authorized to say goodbye to the admiral and sail out into a certain area of the world and ravage enemy merchant shipping that's the orders that every frigate's captain wanted so he could say, my Admiral, I'd love being under your thumb all this time, but I got to leave you because I'm going to go out and attack merchant shipping from now on. Why was that more interesting to those ship's captains? Why did they want to do that? Exactly so. First of all, they did get away from the Admiral. That counted a lot, I think. Um, but basically, they could take the the merchant ship that they captured, first of all, they're not as heavily armed and they're not as well trained, so they're easier pickings. But it's the cargoes that they held. They would uh, capture the ship, hopefully not sink it, and then they could drag it into a friendly or a neutral harbor and there sell it to the highest bidder. They could sell the cargo or they could actually sell the whole ship. And who got the money? Got well, the money came back to the officers and crew. Now, the officers got that much of the pie, the crew got this much of the pie, but everybody got a piece of pie. If you're in the line of battle, you ain't getting no pie. <laughs> you're not going to capture individually those, those uh, individual ships. Way back in the Spanish Armada in 1588, before they had the line and so forth, it doesn't matter. Francis Drake said, to heck with that, all you other Englishmen, I'm gonna sail out there and capture somebody. But by the time they have the line of battle arranged uh, after the 1660s, and from then until the end of the age of sail, and then they reinvented it in World War I, by the way, the line of battle held sway. And that just explains the four, um, uh, the four line of battle rates, and then the fifth and sixth rate, and the non-rated ships. As far as the crew is concerned, I showed you they had 726, I think it was, uh, vessels in the Royal Navy in 1804. By 1812, they had over a thousand. And they tried and tried and tried to entice people to join the Navy 
with bounties, you join the Navy, we'll give you X number of pounds or what have you. But no matter what they did, they could never get enough sailors to man a thousand ships on a volunteer basis. So what did they do if they needed more sailors? Raise the barge. <laughs> you can see right there. What's that called? Impressment. impressment. That's called impressment. It's actually just a fancy word for Shanghaiing. Let's say a captain had a an authorized crew of 240 men, but he only had 220. So he can pull into a port, friendly port, an English port, get his lieutenant to the side and say, Lieutenant, find me the six biggest thugs in the crew, give them a club, take them into town. I need 20 more men. You get them however you're going to get them. So what did they do? They went to the bars and they clumped everybody over the head. And when they woke up three miles out to sea, they were told, guess what, son? You're now in the Royal Navy and you're going to stay in the Royal Navy until we tell you you can leave. So were these happy crews? It got worse and worse as we approached the Napoleonic era and it got the worst during the Napoleonic era. So these guys were um, reluctant. Englishmen were reluctant to sail in the Royal Navy. If they had the choice, would they rather get into a ship of the line or a cruiser? Cruiser. It was a lot easier to entice people to join uh, a cruiser's crew than it was for these ships of the line, because at least you could get rich. That is, if you didn't die in the effort, what this says, the estimated fatal casualties in the Royal Navy, 1793 to 1815, that's the 22 years of the Napoleonic Wars. And you can see here that of, a, of 103,600 Royal Navy sailors who died during that 22 year period. How many of them died from enemy action? 6%. Well, what happened to the other 94%? They just died. There were so many ways to die on these ships that it was worth your life to get out of harbor on a clear day because you could fall off the yard arm. Somebody could, I, I mean, there's just a gazillion ways of dying on these things. And I remember your reaction when you saw this the first time you went, oh my God, look at that. Only 6,000 of them. That's for sure. Yeah. <laughs> so did, were people anxious to sail on these things? No, they were not. Um, I, I've, I love that, that uh, table right there because it shows you that this was a very dangerous business. And uh, the officers who took over, they went to sea when they were 13 and 14 years old, A, to learn how to sail a ship, but B, to learn how to manage an unhappy crew. I'll show you how they did it. That shows you that in those days, whether you were on a three-decker, a two-decker, or a single-decker, two-decker or three-decker, you lived on the lowest deck. The lowest deck was called the gun deck. Um, and that's where they ate and slept. These are hammocks up here uh, attached to the, to the beams. And these guys are in peacetime, obviously. They've got some women there and they're just kicking back. Here, the same thing, they got a wrestling match going on. This is where they lived. And this is how they lived. The blue things, the little dots there that look like a, uh, a, a thing of rice, those are hammocks for the crew. How wide were they? Side to side, 18 inches. They did have two watches, so sometimes they could get a little bit more out of it, but it's basically they're packed in there like sardines. What are the red ones? Nope. 
Hmm? Nope. Those are the Marines. The Marines. Well, what did the Marines do? You can see there's quite a few on this ship. What did the Marines do? What was their job at sea? Order. Say again? Keep order. Keep order. That's what I was driving at. When they got into battle, they're the guys who climbed up the crowds, positioned themselves in the fighting tops, what we sometimes call crow's nest. They would get up there in the fighting top and they would shoot down onto the enemy deck or they would shoot into the fighting tops of the enemy they were locked up with. But more than that, they're the captain's police force. They're the ones who made sure that there was good order and discipline, both during times of peace and during battle. They always sent a couple of Marines down. And when the battle started and people freaked out and ran away from the guns, the Marines shot them to encourage the rest of them to stay in place on their guns. They always did that. And I used this, uh, this uh, uh, anecdote um, the other day to explain to, uh, to Rick, if you think about it, you, we all know the story of Captain Bly and the bounty, right? And that there was a mutiny and that they put him in over the side in a boat and he sailed 4,000 miles, which is the most astonishing feat that ever was. But do you know why the crew mutinied and, and did all of that? Well, they were unhappy. That's why they did. Do you know why they were able to do it? Because he didn't have any Marines on board the bounty. Not a one. He had nobody, once his lieutenant turned against him, he had nobody to back up his word. That's what the Marines were doing. And they also guarded his liquor store. There's always a Marine on the, on the spirit room there. So uh, the lower deck is where uh, these guys lived. Even if their job during the day was out on the bowsprit or up in the, the top of the mainmast, they lived down here. Um, that's uh, just a panoramic shot I took of the, of the gallery this morning. And I wanted to just point out this guy over here. This is the model that may be the earliest surviving scale model in the world from the English Commonwealth Navy in the 1650s. But right here, these two guys are mannequins. And we've placed them on the lower deck amongst the guns. Were there guns on the lower deck? They lived amongst the guns. We couldn't put a hammock up here because we didn't have enough room, but they would have slept from beam to beam. And here they're eating. I don't know if you can see this or not, but that plate is square, which gave rise to what? Square meal. Square meal, that's right. And they're also imbibing in what looks like beer. Does it not? Yeah. Here's eating at sea. And as you can see, here are all the guys that are carousing down there on the lower deck and they've got their table uh, essentially on a gimbal, just like we have. So the, when the ship uh, rocked, the, all the plates, all the square plates would stay on there. And they're having a good time hanging on the guns and telling sea stories. Um, but you can see that there is also a table right here of victualing and health. The Brits were way far ahead of everybody else in prescribing a weekly menu that every single person in the Royal Navy uh, was privy to as long as he was at sea. And, and what they did is that every week, everybody was uh, authorized uh, a portion of bread, beer, beef, pork, fish, peas, oatmeal, butter, and cheese. That's peas like green peas. Again, bread, beer, beef, pork, fish, peas, oatmeal, butter, and cheese, what's missing from a balanced diet? Fruit. Is that because the Englishmen didn't like fruit? No, when they left harbor, they had as much fruit as they could pack onto these ships. But it all went bad within two weeks, just like it does today in your our refrigerator. Um, so there's no fruit. And what else is, is missing? 
from a normal weekly diet. <laughs> yeah, you got oatmeal, that's true. It's not rum that's missing, it's water that's missing. There's no water because they, well, they did. Why didn't they carry, I mean, they did carry water, but it wasn't like a, a, a weekly ration of it. Basically, the water did what the fruit did. It went bad after just a couple of weeks. So, uh, and it started to grow bugs, green, slimy thing. And so to, to cut down on that, they simply added alcohol to it, which killed the bugs, most of them anyway. Uh, so they were all authorized, not water per day, but beer. And you can see if you haven't already looked at this, on Sundays, everybody got a gallon of beer. Everybody on the ship, including the midshipmen, the nine-year-old midshipmen, what have you, they all got a gallon of beer a day. And that was dispensed in two meals, a breakfast meal and a dinner meal. So they got a half a gallon uh, at the start of the day and they got a half a gallon at the end of the day and they had to drink it on the spot. They couldn't sell it to their, to their uh, uh, colleagues. Uh, they had to drink it right there. It was very watered down. They didn't want these crewmen to get so drunk that they would fall off the yard arm and end up one of those estimated casualties during the Napoleonic Wars. But these guys, this is a hard life, and these guys wanted to get drunk. So just like the Naval Academy has done on more than one occasion since I've been here, they offer, the mids go into town, they get sloppy drunk, and then in terrible trouble. So one way to deal with that is to allow them to drink on the grounds. So every so often there'll be a new order that comes out and says, okay, first these can drink in such and such a building. Did that stop the problem? No, they just drink on the grounds and then they go into town and get snockered and come on back again. Well, uh, it was kind of like that here. They all wanted their, their uh, daily um, ration of beer, watered down beer, which they called what? Grog. Grog, from a guy whose nickname was Old Grogan because Grogan was a kind of wool coat and he wore one. So he got, he gave his name to, uh, to Grog and to George Washington's home. What was that guy's name? Admiral Vernon, there you go. Um, Grain, right? The uh, material, that's what the kind of pebbles the yeah. materials. Yeah. Um, so he was responsible for getting them a daily ration of their beer. If they were in the Caribbean, they didn't drink beer, watered down beer. They drank watered down what? Rum. Rum. And if they were in the Far East, what did they drink? Watered down rice wine, sake, whatever. Whatever it was, they wanted that buzz every day. <laughs> and when they were ranging up for battle, if you're in line ahead, from the time you spot the enemy on the horizon until the time the, the battle uh, uh, commences, how much time could pass? Days, <laughs> not just hours, but day, it could if the wind and the currents were such. Um, and during those days, they could look out there and say, that's the guy that's gonna kill me. I think I'll get drunk. And so they would make a raid on the, on the captain's liquor supply and they'd get shot by the Marines. And th this happened throughout the age of sail. Many battles were fought by sailors who were so snockered that they couldn't point a gun. Yes, sir. So for ships where there's 200 men on board, each one gets a gallon of beer, a lot of That is a lot of beer. In fact, I, I think I skipped it, but I, somewhere in here, uh, I have mentioned that way back in the 1600s, they were expected to be able to stay at sea for four months at a time. And by this time, by the, the American Revolution, let's say, it was up to six months. And they had these huge crews. They, they had to carry all that food and all that, that uh, beer, uh, but also 
gunpowder. So that's why they only made six knots at the, uh, on their best point of sale on, under ideal conditions because they weighed so much. Um, after they had imbibed, had their breakfast, had their dinner, had their gallon of beer, sooner or later they had to go to the bathroom. How did you go to the bathroom in the age of sail? Well, you showed us how they go to the bathroom on, on uh, yachts and whatnot today. In those days, they would go to the head of the ship and they did in fact call it the head of the ship, but they didn't call going to the bathroom going to the head. And they didn't call toilets heads. The part of the ship was called the head, but the toilets they called seats of ease. Not because they were easy to use, <laughs> but because going to the bathroom was called easing oneself in polite company. So in this example, all our models have these, by the way, they all put the sanitary uh, business on the ship. Here, this ship has four seats of ease on the beak head. One in the corner, two, three standalones, and a fourth one in the corner over here that you can't see from that angle. Trouble is, the ship that that model represents had a crew of 360 men. You got four toilets. You got 360 men. Come on, I gotta go. So I can only envision two scenarios. One, it looks like the opera house at intermission with long lines in front of the bathroom, right? Waiting and waiting and waiting. Did that happen? No, that didn't happen. The other one is that they just didn't use the heads or the seats of ease. What did they do? To <laughs> delivered, right. Here's another model with the seats of ease in it, and these round projections here uh, enclosed another toilet that was reserved for the warrant officers on board. The, cook and whatnot. Uh, yeah. Um, here we have an actual image. I was able to buy that print at an auction for us. Great big long thing. It's this long. And it shows the little man using the seat of ease uh, in the age of sale. Was that dangerous? Put him in the North Sea in September because in December they wouldn't even go there. But uh, the ship is pitching like this. Could he get thrown right off into Davy Jones's locker? He absolutely could. Um, but if they didn't use the seats of ease, they did what they called going to the chains. The chains was a shortened version of um, the word for this fitting right here, not really a fitting, but part of the ship, called the channel. So chains is just short for channels. And what was the main purpose of the channel right here? You can see it. The yeah, it was to secure the shrouds, which have the rungs on them so that the crew could run up to the fighting tops. That's not really their primary mission, by the way. Before somebody figured out putting rungs on it, they still had these things. They're actually used to keep the, the mast upright. They had to uh, secure them from all four angles, and this is off, off on the side. But they were secured down here on the channels. When the men needed to go to the bathroom, they would get in front of one of these things and they'd crawl out a gun port right there, and they'd drop down onto this channel. They'd turn, put their backs to the sea, drop trousers, hold on to these lanyards right here, and do their business directly into the sea. Was that dangerous? <laughs> These things, again, are built, this one is built at quarter inch to the foot, and you can see that the water, well, the water line would have been right about here, just above the main whale here. And the distance between that and that channel is six feet. You know, it could be five and a half, it could be seven feet. What happened if there was an eight foot or nine foot swell? 
Right. Right. Away you went. Right. That's exactly right. So going to the bathroom in the age of sale was worth your life. Some of these models have urinals on them, two for a crew of 180. I'm, it would imagine that most of the crew didn't use them. And where did the officers go to the bathroom, by the way? The poop deck, yeah. Um, uh, I see if I can find one. Well, I'll just tell you, they had chamber pots in the stern as far away from the bow as they could get. And they had people attend to them there in their quarter galleries. That's uh, so that was their living establishment. Hanging off those chains and you were constipated, would that be called uh, being in irons? <laughs> uh, they probably felt like that. Being put, by the way, on a ration of bread and water, what does that do to you? Plugs you right up, so, makes you miserable. Uh, Grant, I think you're, you're, you're at this point, but kind of bringing together the crews, the line of battle, the tactics, yeah. and things. You want to uh, get on to the, uh, the Battle of the Capes? Huh? There it is. Next slide. Okay. That's not the Battle of the Capes, but that is a book on tactics. These guys in all of the major navies, including the American Navy when we got one, published books on tactics and maneuvering individual ships and groups of ships. And this one, uh, the rear to pass and form the van. How do you do that? How do you make the rear become the van? And there's a very specific set of things that you've got to do in order to do that, that to maneuver. And then they would show it in any number of diagrams. These are gorgeous books. They were actually used by everybody way back when, uh, certainly in the 1700s and early 1800s. So they, this is what the people on those line of battleships did their whole lives. They practiced that stuff at the Admiral's behest, doing fleet maneuvers. And there, these books showed all a, a, a thousand different things that you might have to do at sea when you're sailing with the fleet. The Battle of the Chesapeake or the Battle of the Capes in the old days, they would explain that to history students and students who were interested in the battle by means of static diagrams. Uh, the British fleet in line ahead at the approach moves into an east-west line of bearing. And do you think they practiced that over and over and over again, how to do that? They did. Um, and uh, the fleet wears onto the port tack. Well, there had to be signals. You know, the battle hasn't started. There's no smoke. They haven't fired yet. So they can use the signal flags and tell every ship's captain, this is what the Admiral wants. He wants it now, and you know how to do it. And keep your place in the damn line of battle. And Grant, the term wears, do you uh, want to explain the means? Well, tacking and, uh, oh, uh, yeah, uh, essentially falling down on, uh, on the enemy. Uh, they, they would get to a certain distance. They would arraign themselves so that you have two lines of battle, the French and the English, and then they can come together. These, that's later on in the battle, you get another diagram. But when we reopened our museum in 2009, we contracted with a firm up in Boston who made a battle, uh, a video battle map of that same battle. And this is what we use nowadays. And Great, just before we okay. go into that, I was just saying, do you want to give just a little bit of context for the, the battle itself and, and yeah. how it came That's about? Good point. George Washington was an army guy. But George Washington came to the American Revolution with a very solid command of naval strategy. He knew what he wanted to do with the British and how to win this damn war. And he actually almost pulled it off in Boston. But what he wanted to do, Washington from the start, wanted to pin a British army with its back to the sea. Then he would build siege lines around it, fill those full of cannon, and besiege the, uh, the uh, trapped English army. But every time he set that up, what happened? They escaped. How did they escape? Ships. 
the Royal Navy came to the rescue and pulled that army away from danger. They all boarded the Royal Navy ships and sailed away and Washington's sitting there, damn, you know. <laughs> In 1778, because of a lot of uh, moderate American victories, the French entered in on our side. Was it hard to convince the French to fight the English? <laughs> no. And we were fighting the English, a friend of my friend, etc. cetera. So um, Washington around Yorktown was finally, with Rochambeau, he was finally able to pin that army with its back to the sea, only after 1778 with the French, when the French came in, they sent some officers over here, they sent a number of troops over here, but mostly what did they do? They gave George Washington a fleet, a Navy. And what they did at the Battle of the Capes, he pinned the army, the British army, with their backs to the sea, the British, just like they knew, sent a fleet to come save the army, but when they got there, they found the French fleet blocking the way. And a battle transpired called the Battle of the Capes. It's not that the French won a resounding victory, but the English didn't win. And they went away and they abandoned that British army and Washington was able to pound it into submission and we end up with the end of the war. Yes, so this is all part of, Yorktown. yeah, this is all part of Yorktown, okay? So this is what we have in the museum now. I think if I punch that, I don't know. There it goes. Okay. Can you see this? All right. You can see where it happened, the Battle of the Capes. Uh, that's Cape Henry. But it's down by Yorktown. This is the French fleet. They know the Brits are coming, but they don't know where they're coming from. So they release a couple of frigates cruisers from the fleet and they sail up here all the way to Williamsburg. Seen any Brits? Anybody seen any Brits out here? Nope, nobody had seen any Brits. So those frigates come back and they report to the French uh, commander in chief de Grasse that there's nobody up there. But meanwhile, they had also, de Grasse had also positioned a frigate way out here to see what's coming. And eventually, what does he see on the horizon? First one, then two, then 30 English ships. As soon as he sees them, he flips around and heads back to the French to tell them they're coming. Could they see him do that? Yes. Um, and so there was no surprise coming in here, but at this point, things are starting to happen. And what are they doing? They're forming that line of battle. And you can see where the different uh, portions of the fleet are with the van and the center and so forth. And then they make this maneuver here where they drop down and look at all these ships out here. And this one right here. Now you've got two lines of battle sailing essentially in the same direction, but they're getting closer and closer together at the van. And at a given moment, they get to firing range and they proceed to fire away. Meanwhile, these guys are relaying messages up and down the, the British line. He's uh, relaying messages up and down the French line. And um, as was very typical in those days, they didn't sink anybody. These ships were very hard to sink. You could pound them into, into smithereens and they would still float unless somebody got to the powder machine. And then that's how they were oftentimes sunk. But they continue down the bay. Eventually they break aside. The British thought about re-engaging it, doing it again. The French keep them from doing that. And then eventually the British just give up He sails back to the Cape, to the Capes, and this guy, he, he wanted to go back and do it again, but everything was wrong at that point, and he'd suffered. These ships didn't get sunk, but they were really battered to death, and their crews were uh, really pounded. So he went back to the bay, and the British ended up going up to New York, abandoning Cornwallis 
which led to the end of the war. So this is how, this is a prop that we use in our history classes now to teach, I think we have 33 of these, something like that, different battles uh, way up to World War II where they've got aircraft going all over everywhere. So that's, they're a little busy, but this is how we do it nowadays. We think that this is much, 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 much more engaging than looking at those diagrams in a book and trying to figure out the, the naval terminology. Okay, so that's, that was the end of my pitch at this point. Do I have uh, questions? Yes, sir. Uh, sure, yeah. um, on the uh, boatyard model that are really there, if one came up on the market, what would they probably sell it for? <laughs> what do dockyard models bring when, they're, when they come up on auction? And there is an auction uh, every couple of years where one of these will show up. Most of them are in museums now. There are very few in private hands. When they do come up, Several hundred thousand dollars would be easy. Uh, I was involved in one that sold at Christie's New York for a million and a quarter. So, and we have many models that would bring that kind of money if, if they ever came up for sale. That was full scale, it wasn't a quarter scale. Full scale boat. I got a phone call a number of years ago from a guy who asked us if we had any photographs of a ship model that represented the St. George of 1701. And she was a second rate, a three-decker, 96-gun uh, second rate from 1701. And he introduced himself as being uh, uh, something from Odyssey Undersea Exploration. So I said, treasure hunters, huh? I said, you could call it that. I said, did you find something that had to do with the St. George? And I finally got him to say, no, I know she's a three-decker and what we found is a two-decker, but she's 1701 and what we found uh, in the way of a wreck was 1693, so that's pretty close. And I said, really, you got a two-decker? Hmm. Why do you want pictures of a three-decker from 1701 when we have a model of a two-decker from 1693? And he said, you do? I said, yeah. And he said, what ship is that? He said, the Sussex. I said, the Sussex. <gasps> and I hear this, <gasps> on the other hand, I'll get back to you. And five minutes later, another guy called me up. He said, you have a model of the Sussex? I said, yeah. Did you find this, the wreck of the Sussex? He said, mm, maybe. <laughs> and it turned out, that they did find it and they had spent seven years and 12 million dollars searching for it and the the sussex actually went down in the straits of gibraltar just one year after she was launched so in 1694 she took a crew of 550 to a watery grave um and was promptly forgotten by everybody but not everybody because in 2000 five or something, some scholar uh, uncovered some records in the Spanish archives in Seville that referred to the wreck of the Sussex as carrying a huge treasure. And indeed she did. And basically there's a little uh, place called uh, the Duchy, uh, oh, I can't think, uh, it'll come to me, a little part of France, Savoy. Savoy. And the guy in charge, the Duke of Savoy, sent a letter to Charles II in England and said, I'm on your side, notably, but the French are willing to pay me a whole lot more than you're paying me. And if you don't match that offer, I'm going over to the French. Charles II says, oh my God, I can't lose that ally. But that was, he wanted a lot of money, the Duke did. So they basically took half of England's national uh, income, their gross national product, and they put it on board the Sussex and then sent her down clandestinely to the Straits of Gibraltar. She made it, but when going through the Straits to deliver the gold to the Duke of Savoy, she got caught in a storm and went down. And then a couple of hundred years later, these guys from Odyssey found it. But when they went to work the site, they, they came out into the, into the uh, the, the roads of uh, the harbor there and found 5,000 Spanish fishing boats 
all saying, Yankee, go home. And that's what happened. And that wreck is still on the bottom of the Strait of Gibraltar. She's 3,000 feet down, so you're not going to dive on her. But she probably, well, what she had, the, the, the phrase that attracted everybody's attention was she was carrying a million in specie. That's a million pounds in gold and silver bricks and coins. And in today's world, that would bring a pretty penny. But nobody can touch it because the Spanish won't let them ply those waters. You know, there's all these international politics going on. But I, the reason I brought that up is because the guy in charge of Odyssey came up to the Naval Academy. I showed him the model and he said, OK, how much? And I said, it's not for sale. We can't sell anything. He said, a million, million dollars. I said, we can't sell this model. Forget about it. OK, two million. <laughs> We still have the model and the ship is still on the bottom. So that's the answer to your question. They would bring uh, that model of the Sussex would bring a million bucks easy because it's perfect. It's perfect. It's pristine. And uh, oh, the, yeah, the ship lasted one year. Uh, the models made it since, since uh, 1993. Okay. Other questions? I have one quick question. Uh huh. I may have missed it. So the mod, the uh, that, that dockyard model. Dockyard right? models, right? You said they're hollow, right? Yeah. And they're built to scale everything, even inside. Yes. Can you actually see those layers, or is it? Sometimes you can see them, but we went over to England uh, many years ago and found that the Brits had devised a fiber optic uh, instrument. Um, they make two different kinds in the biggest kind of the world. They make medical ones and they make industrial ones. And what they used was ones that people were using to poke inside jet engines. And basically it's a camera on the end of a long tube um, that looks about like a pencil, I guess. And you put it inside whatever you're looking at and it will flash it up on the video screen, that camera will. So we came back here real lickety split, got our own medical equipment still has blood on it. <laughs> and we don't poke into stomachs, we poke into these models. We've probed them many times because it never gets old. There are things down there that you cannot see, including little miniature uh, fire hearths and stoves, um, uh, all kinds of uh, line uh, capstans and that sort of thing, chicken coops, um, sometimes a name. That's what we really are all after, are the are names that some that the actual model builder stuck inside his model when nobody was looking. And we have in fact found a couple of those. Now. They were done as a gift to, you know, and the guy couldn't he didn't have a fiber optic. So why did they go to that trouble? Well, they're pretty, pretty. Oh wow, we don't know why they went to that much trouble. I can only imagine it was pride of craftsmanship. Yeah. That's all I can think of. Um but it's astonishing. And as I say, the first time we did it in every model, we were looking at things that no human eyeball had seen for several hundred years. And they're just, they're gorgeous. There are ones in England that we don't have that have paintings in the captain's cabin on his walls and so forth. Yeah. Yes, ma'am. Um, I've heard about Mallow's Bay as a ship, ghost shipyard here. Is that the one near? near here? Yes. Uh -huh. Yeah, that's got Joshua Barney's fleet in it from the American Revolution. Um, he, he fought a battle which he lost, but again, uh, against the Brits, but again, he held them up uh, beautifully in the American Revolution. So I understand that as late as 1968, you could see those things from the surface without any trouble. I've had people who were born and raised here tell me that until 1968, you could walk into the into the, the water at Solomon's Island, and it was clear as a bell. Just 1968, now you can't see three inches down. Yeah. But um, yeah, I, I, I think that's fascinating. I would love to, to learn more about it. And I know a lot of underwater archeologists are, are really into that now. So I would imagine that there are people working on those, those I mean, crafts. Were they made out of metal? Or are they just rusting away? Or Oh no, they're made out of wood. They're all wood. Yeah, yeah, and some of them have more left than others. Yeah. 
Yeah, but we don't, you probably wouldn't realize it, but underwater archaeology has leapt forward ever since Robert Ballard got into the business. And, uh, you know, Robert Ballard, uh, he's a guy who found the Titanic and the Bismarck and so forth. We're not, they're not only looking for and finding the Titanic and the Bismarck, they're finding sailing vessels from way back when. And the one place, actually, it's right in the news right now, the Black Sea, that's where these guys want to go because after 50 feet down, there's no oxygen. Uh, and so there's no worms, there's no bugs, there's no nothing. And he predicted that we would find uh, Greek warships down there. The Black Sea has been plied since Greek times, maybe even with the lines on them still and skeletons and whatnot. So it's because of underwater robotics and, uh, and uh, all the high-tech business that they're using to look for minerals and for famous modern ships like Bismarck. There are also, there's lots of guys that are looking for, and women now, for, um, for shipwrecks from way back when. Uh, in Middle Ages terms, there's very few examples left of actual Middle Ages ships, and, uh, unless you know a couple of Viking ships were buried and those have been found and, and uh, put on display now. But there's lots of vessel types from the Middle Ages. We don't have any example, not a one, uh, of a real one. So they're looking for those with all of this modern gear. And they find them all the time. If you were into, into the subject, you'd see that they make major discoveries all the time now. Yep. And I do for interest in the side work, man, if, if you can get the stock call, but the, uh, the Vasa, which was a, uh, a a sovereign of the seas, at least for the, yeah. the king of Sweden, that yeah. capsized, and but because the of the the water and the I guess because it was cold, the it worms didn't eat yeah. it, and so they raised it, and they have uh, uh, an incredible museum where you can see uh, what from the 1650s an intact. Yeah. You can see one of our dockyard models 50 times bigger. <laughs> and the, the Vasa was going to be the pride of the fleet. So she was really decorated and really fancy, but she was poorly designed. And on her maiden voyage, she weighed anchor, sailed out in the middle of the, of the harbor. The whole city's out there, and they watch her go boop, and then right straight down. Oh, yeah. Which right I, in front of everybody. But it bit. also answers a, a question that the models were not used to test out these boats and see their stability and any of the other characteristics, right? Uh, that's true. There were some early efforts that are surprisingly modern using tow tanks with little wooden chips from way back when. Uh, but basically, no, that's what happened. And, and uh, they have had a terrible time trying to keep the Vasa together um, now that it's out of the water and oxygen does terrible things to it and so forth. But it, well, you won't forget it anytime <laughs> soon. I, I haven't been there. I, one of my one of my things. Well, uh, excellent. Uh, th this is an incredible talk. Um, thank you very much. But right. thank you very much. I get the feeling I was a little scatterbrained. No, no, no. no. Basically I, speaking, well, that's. I, I think I, I hope. Oh, I'm sorry. Oh, I'm sorry. Yes, ma'am or sir. Never mind. What? Uh, Building uh, in the academy are the models located where the museum is. Oh, it's just inside gate three, which is the gate at the foot of Maryland Avenue. So if you go to the state house and come down Maryland Avenue, you end up at gate three, which is closed now. But just inside that, uh, I mean, you used to be able to drive on right there, and now you can't. But um, uh, we're just inside that, uh, almost the first building. We're right across from the chapel. We're in the center of the um, uh, the grounds there, very, very pricey territory in Naval Academy circles. We're ever having to fend off somebody who wants to <laughs> take our museum and turn it into a physics lab or something. And, uh, so in terms of the museum, it's really, it's the history of the US Navy. So it, it's great in terms of how it takes you chronologically through the development of the Navy. And we focus obviously on the, the age of fighting sail, but up to World War One, the dreadnoughts, you know, to World War Two, to so it's uh, and 
I think you can kind of do it in two hours. I mean, you could spend the whole day there, but it it, it moves quickly. Uh, yeah, and so free. yeah, you can come on anytime. Um, and we would love to have each and every one of you do it. If you do come to the museum, ask for me, and I'll give you the cook's tour. I'll yeah, be happy to do that. Uh, yeah, it's it's tremendous. And I, so I would say, uh, I mean, uh, Grant and I would kind of uh, he, he at least um, fill out this idea I had of uh, while floating on the water. What was it like back then? What were the similarities and differences? And I, you can see how obviously modern boat design and communication are much different, but um, you also see things like racing tactics, how they in some ways were derived by uh, an age where uh, knowing all the factors in terms of the, the water uh, conditions, your competition made a difference in life and death and and still we're either then or now we're, we're governed by the, the wind and the, <laughs> the direction. And the current, that's right. And, uh, so uh, anyway, we'll, we'll, we'll continue to explore this topic, but we uh, very much appreciate you uh, being here today to hear it. Thank you.